welcome for another I'm sure pleasant cafe race or at least for me uh, my uh, cafe race helps my own sanity through discussing with people I usually have a little chat with no and then thank you for joining us Kat hello it's uh, nice to be here it's nice to have been asked uh, and to actually get to see you Callum it feels like it's been way too long um, since we've actually had a reason to well, we always have reason to chat, but since we've actually done this, because we haven't actually been able to see each other in, in the same place in a while. So this is nice. It's like I need to invite you to stuff and have microphones set up for you to talk to me. Last time was in I mean, Dragon Meat, I think. <laughs> I mean, if you put a microphone in front of me, you know I'm always going to talk, right, Callum? You know well, that. I'm not like that um, at all. You... <laughs> <laughs> no, you never need an excuse to talk to me, but uh, it is nice actually. It's like you said, Dragon Meat. I think was the last time we've we actually got to hang out. It's been it was been a busy couple of months, and then we all went into lockdown. So, so could you introduce yourself briefly for people who don't yep. follow the show so... and haven't seen your regular appearances? <laughs> For those handful of people who may not have met me or don't know me, don't follow me on Twitter, I am uh, Kat Tulip. You will find me on Twitter uh, as Kat Tulip. Um, I have done a lot of work with Callum. Uh, we ran the podcast zone together. So I am, um, I don't know, your faithful sidekick <laughs> at doing things like events. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I currently do a YouTube channel called Did and D&D, &D, uh, which is looking at dissociative dissociative identity disorder through the means of uh, building alters in RPG and D&D. &D. So it's basically breaking down stigma, mental health, that kind of thing. You're probably also thinking, I recognize that voice, I recognize that face, I've been on a lot of streams, I've done podcasts, so yes, you probably have heard these dulcet tones before. So Many my, times. my first ice-breaking question, uh, I'm trying to make it a tradition, yep. uh, because the show it's kind of uh, who was it? It was what's his name? Mm, forgot his name. Uh, gentleman from uh, Darker Days Radio. The word is cathartic uh, in terms of the the self isolation and so on. So, what is currently your routine in those circumstances? Um, well, when I'm not obsessively cleaning, because uh, I have quite an obsessive personality. Um, I also, being autistic, really struggle without having a set routine. So trying to refine a routine for myself was quite difficult. Um, trying to control what's happening at the moment and my anxiety uh, results in me cleaning a lot, obsessively. Um, I often just take my other half's keys and disinfect them for, you know, because I feel safe then if I do that. Um, I'm still working. Uh, technically, I'm working from home at the moment. So my routine for the most part is um, I, I spend most of my day working. Um, I try and work from nine, half nine to half five. I try and really stick to a time rather than just being like, oh, I'm working from home. I can do anything, anytime. I try and really have that that routine of, of getting up and getting dressed and, you know, getting dressed properly and not wearing my pajamas. Uh, and sitting down at my desk and, and working. Um, so for the most part, other than not commuting, my routine's not changed massively. Um, not commuting, by the way, is a brilliant thing. I am loving working from home 24 seven and not having to come into London. Although I love my friends in London, you know, but I bloody hate going to London. So this is actually really nice. Um, I don't go out much at the moment. I literally go out once a week at the moment to do the food shop. Um, that is it. I go out once a week. I obsessively clean everything when it gets home. I obsessively wash my hands. Um, so that for me, it's, I guess it's not really a massive change. Like the biggest change for me is, is having to see my friends on video calls and not at their house. It's kind of weird. Like my best friends live five minutes that way and I haven't seen them in months. Well, a month. We can come so. back to the, the topic of friends on, online because it, I think it's quite yeah. interesting what it's it's doing to relationships yeah. and, and maybe old relationships in the, in my case. Uh, my other question is, is there anything you, a new skill or hobby you picked up uh, as a result uh, of the situation? Well, um, so one of the things I love doing anyway is cooking. Um, so it's not really a new skill, but I've been more adventurous in the kitchen, just trying to do, I've got the time. So I'm just, you know, cooking up stuff I've never cooked before. 
um as anybody who saw my facebook story um, i made some really sexy looking cheese um chips good, good chip. they were really nice um the other main thing i've been doing is um because hopefully in may uh, we're going to start streaming the game for did and D that we've been working towards wow. i've been teaching myself things like video obs that kind of stuff um not got very far with it yet but that's something that i've got the time to so i'm doing that and the main thing i've been doing is oh working on my bouquet for my wedding oh wow so uh i have uh, been drilling dice uh, and sticking them into these um i have got some feathers that i'm starting to so i'm starting to build my bouquet so I've watched a lot of YouTube videos. Um, I'm trying to work out how to make buttonholes as well. So the things that men attach their suits. Uh, again, teaching myself, watching videos. So that's, I guess, I don't know if you'd call it a new skill. It's not really a skill. I'm not sure drilling holes into dice is considered a skill. Well, it's craft, um, you know. But it's, yeah, I've been doing new crafting things because I've got the time. And it's really nice to sit in the garden with the laptop, watch some crap on Netflix and just try and be arty and crafty oh, it's i can't nice. do anything else you so have, you have a garden that's quite nice i do have a garden yes so when i say to people i don't go out a lot of my friends a lot of the people i work with who work in london are like oh but how are you coping i'm like mate i've got an 80 foot garden i could just go outside anytime i want i don't have to go out there it's just there so that really helps i think for me being able to just go and sit in this garden have some sunshine and not have to deal with people because that makes me really anxious. Yeah, I would imagine. Well, was it you uh, who posted right at the beginning uh, you had difficulties at work because the, the, they would force people to come too much? Or maybe I'm confusing two things. Uh... I mean, I did have a lot of difficulties at work. I, working in London and just working with people and, and, and being quite close to people, um, it just made me very, very like, I. Weirdly, so in February, when some people have started to get a bit anxious, I was like, no, it's fine. You know, this is not a big thing. Let's not worry. And then once Italy started to really struggle and everyone kind of in Europe went, oh, wait, hang on a second. This is not just a thing that's in China. This is actually, you know, close to home now. And Italy is one of the, I mean, it has one of the best healthcare systems in Europe and it started to collapse. At that point, I suddenly was like, I, I can't, I can't stay in London. I can't work in London anymore. Um, and before, so our office closed a week before the lockdown. Uh, but, but even before that, my boss was like, please just don't come back to the office. And just, if you're happy working from home, I'm happy not dealing with your anxiety. Um, but I did start to really, really worry and get really panicked about being in London. Uh, and then I kind of was justified because then I discovered that London was actually two weeks ahead of everybody else. And so I was like, oh, I'm really glad I came home when I did then. Like my family were like, oh, I'm so glad you got out of London when you did. And can you keep checking your temperature and make sure you haven't caught? And because I was really worried that maybe I'd caught something in London before I'd come home. Um, but I'm, I'm OK. I've checked my temperature every day. I don't have a cough. I'm all good. Um, Great. But yeah, it's, it was stressful. Yeah, and it's it's good that some uh, some people, uh, Persephilia is lucky, our employer. So we, we calculated this weekend, we reached our sixth week. It was our sixth week in uh, self-isolation at home. Uh, yeah. And I think for the rest of the UK, it was the fourth week. Uh, it's been fifth yeah. week. And myself, I, I, I was unemployed uh, and still am unemployed. Uh, and it's been fifth week since uh, my son's uh, nursery is being closed. So that that's when stuff yeah. started really being uh, intense at home. <laughs> I can imagine. I mean, I it's kind of, I suppose, because my other half still has to go out for work. So what he discovered um, about four weeks ago was that he's a he's classified as a key worker. He never realised that. He did not know he was a key worker. He also did not know he was so important to the running of the country until they were like, no, no, you still have to work. What you does can't. he do? Uh, if it's not... um, he de he delivers gas. So a lot of wow. mobile homes, particularly in this area, um, the gas bottles that they'll run off for both heating and cooking, he delivers. Um, and a large portion of his customer base are old people and are vulnerable. Um, but he's also, I mean, I worry dearly about him because he's asthmatic. So he's technically vulnerable himself. But as he pointed out to me, he was like, Cat, my customers are more vulnerable than I am. 
And if I don't do it, they don't get to eat. They don't get to have heating. And actually, that's important right now. So, you know, um, but because he's out every day and I'm working from home, actually, I only see him in the evening. So it's not really changed our dynamics at home. But I know quite a few people who are suddenly at home every day with their other half, like, oh, it's it's you again. Yeah, it's, 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 like, the, it's like that for us. Uh, it's... Uh... The, there's been uh, serious ups and downs, and now we we're starting to get a routine with me, yeah. Pastophilia, and uh, and my son. Uh, but yeah, the the key worker thing is interesting because you know it's not like because yeah in the UK there's a lot of categories of different things including work, mm. but I don't think these were identified. Let's say if you were a no immigrant <laughs> trying to keep a visa to stay in the UK uh, uh, a couple months ago uh, when you were applying for a visa I don't think you were able to be identified no. as key worker so it's uh, it's an epiphany and, now, and I hope suddenly, they will change you know, yeah. yeah I hope they will change the rules to to make it easier for people to stay yeah. and he found like one of the interesting things is out of our group of friends I mean he has He's an incredibly intelligent guy. He's just not got the level of education that some of our friends have. You know, he's not degree educated. So he doesn't need a lot of my friends do degree level jobs. Um, and so he's always had this element of him, you know, like in comparison to me, you know, I've got a degree, you know, I'm very educated. And so he's always felt at a slight disadvantage. And then it's suddenly like, actually, the world doesn't need me right now. We don't really need data analysts. I can do, I, I don't even really need to exist. Whereas his job is so needed right now. Um, and that's really an, interesting because he's like, you know, I've always been looked down at, as a delivery driver. I mean, we were in a supermarket before they changed the rules and you weren't allowed more than one person from the household in the supermarket. And we were still going together. We happened to be talking to the, the girl at the cashier and I was like, you know, completely understand how you're feeling. He feels the same because he's a delivery driver, you know, so he still has to go out and put himself at risk. And it's, you know, being in a job where people kind of look down on you, but you're also putting yourself at a risk. And a w the woman behind us went, oh my God, are you a delivery driver? And he's like, yeah. And she's like, I just want to say right now, thank you. Thank you for doing your job and thank you for going out there. And he walked out just speechless because he's like, I've never been thanked in my life for doing what's considered an easy job or a unskilled job or you know whatever terms you want to use and then suddenly a complete random stranger is like oh my god you are amazing thank you and he was like i don't know what to do i've never been thanked so that's been a really interesting change just sort of seeing how people have approached those kind of roles whereas before they'd almost be looked down on everyone's like no you are you are valuable right now yeah that's the thing right now i hope i hope all these people will be properly rewarded and hopefully better paid yeah. in the future and better, not only paid, respected. but respected. Yeah, respected and looked after, provided with uh, not only health and safety measures, but uh, financial safety measures. I mean, and so, this... my sister's a teacher. I was going to say, my sister's a teacher. And what's really interesting right now is they're on a rotor because they haven't got lots of kids in at the moment. They're on a rotor. So, they're only keeping a certain amount of teachers in the building at any one time so she didn't work she had a few months a few weeks off and she's now back in the um school today the cleaners are in the school every single day and they've been working more than they have ever worked in their life because they're continuously cleaning so that's really interesting that you know the the actual high school people in the school they're not needed as much as those people who are cleaning she's like the janitors they're at such a risk because they're in every day cleaning up after the other people who are in contact with each other yeah it's I, i'm not i'm not sure if it was cleaners or another a uh, key key k kind of work like that which was uh, underrated in in france uh, my, my father was complaining that uh, oh and, and my mother also uh that they were going on strike at the moment because they didn't have the proper safety equipment and they, they were underpaid and so on. And yeah, and my parents were like, oh yeah, but they shouldn't be doing that right now. It's not fair. They should wait after. It's, it's like, <laughs> nobody cares for these people after and they have no reason to think people will care. Uh, I mean, before and they have no reason to think people will care after. The, the right to to seize the opportunity uh, i mean they they're still doing a amazing work most of them so they're, they're right to seize the opportunity to to try to to improve their their situation mm. uh, yeah yeah <laughs> 
Yeah, I, 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 I'm interested to see how the world changes. Like you said, like, are people going to appreciate these jobs just for now or in the future? Is this going to change what, whenever people go, oh, when we go back to normal, but what is normal going to look like? And is it going to look different to what it was before? Yeah, That's and, quite interesting to see. And you were mentioning commuting. Uh, I mean, uh, I really listen an opportunity to remind my listeners that uh, I'm an architect and urban designer specialized in transport. Uh, and before all of that happened, uh, you know, looking at London and the transport system, uh, there's so much investment and work and the transport system in London is a crazy, amazing infrastructure, but it's difficult for it to cope with the number of commuters, especially at, at peak hour, because everybody shows up at work at the same time and they leave work at the same time. And yeah. that's the that's big challenge. You need to make roads and trains as large as you need them a couple hours in the morning and a couple hours in the evening. It's, it's not that, that simple, but that's pretty much it. So back then we were already, and probably the mayor of London were encouraging businesses and people to look into working from home to release capacity on the transport system. If now people realize they can work from home and employer get more uh, comfortable with that and maybe even uh, it probably will be the case, uh, there are some kind of rules and enforcement because getting back to normal, uh, the only comparison I can make, well, again, working in transport and uh, aviation, well, we never went back to quotation mark normal after something like 9-11 or, no. or, or the terrible attacks which happen in different places in the world. Uh, these change significantly the way we board a flight and we spend time in an airport or a train station. So there will definitely be things which will be different in the way we, we act, we behave, or culturally, you know, you used to, to look at pictures of Chinese urban areas or Japanese urban areas and find it rather weird that people were wearing masks. Well, the reason they were wearing right. masks is because they had faced other epidemics uh, earlier uh, yeah. because of... And obviously, you know, they, they've not, like, you know, in certain areas of China, the air quality has never been good. And I know that it's much more encouraged as a, a, a behavioural, cultural thing for you to wear the mask. Whereas, obviously, um, here, traditionally, if you see someone in a mask beforehand, you'd be like, oh, they obviously have something. Um, and it's kind of adapting to that different sort of approach to things. Um, and actually, like you said, going through the work from home thing, you know, as the charity that I work for, we... As a rule, we, our frontline staff never work from home because they their job is to answer the telephone. Now, we've had to send all of our staff home. Uh, we sent our staff home before London, actually, before the lockdown. We'd already sent our staff home because we're, you know, charity, we're compassionate, we care about our staff's well-being and we didn't want them putting themselves at risk. So we had a massive job to make sure that, you know, everybody was supported at home. And one of the key things was getting our frontline teams to be able to use the phones at home. So they've all gone home with their actual work phones. They've got adapters to make sure that the, it connects to the work line. Um, now, it's really interesting that it was the one thing that we always thought we were never going to be able to have our frontline work from home because of the com compl complicatedness of them having to answer the, the helplines and, and be there. And now we've proved we can. Yeah. So yeah. And, where and does that leave us in the future? Not only you, but all the businesses at Entire the moment world. found out yeah. that actually uh, this thinking that it was not possible, uh, technically f f possible, a lot of people find out that it was. Uh, either they were yeah. thinking it was not possible genuinely, like a like, uh, boss, and sometimes boss would tell that to the employers and the employers would be suspicious of that. Now, not that that bubble is broken. And that's going to be the really interesting thing. I mean, I've read a lot of articles about how this is going to change potentially the future of work. Now, there are going to be certain jobs. So I've got a friend who is a curator in a museum. Currently, that museum is shut to the public and they only have key staff in the building. Um, and she isn't one of those key staff. So she's doing most of her job of create, curating at home, which is like, it's really weird because her job is to oversee these items and she can't oversee them right now. Um so there's going to be certain aspects when we go back to what that over that normal is, where that she'll have to go to the office. Uh, but there's going to be a certain aspects where actually we don't have to. You know, one of the things I do in my job is I train. So I have discovered training works much better when I'm face to face with that person. I'm not having to screen share. 
Uh, so there will probably be a need for me to go to work and go to the office for training. Um, but actually, the rest of what I do is I'm a database analyst and I manage and oversee data in the database and data protection. So do I need to be in the office? I don't have a frontline role. I don't have a key role that demands a lot of staff. You know, I don't manage a team. So actually, there's going to be a really interesting shift in dynamics. I know my my organization have already sort of talked about, you know, what's, you know, the exec team are looking at, well, what does that future look like? Because actually, you can't turn around to the staff and say, no, you have to be in work now, because we've proved that you can work from home. But we just decided we want you in a building because we want to torture you. You know, it's, yeah, we're going to have to look at what the difference is. You know, there's even the aspect, uh, uh, th there's reason why some of my clients, uh, you know, big corporate companies like Procter & Gamble, they, they were, some of them were at the forefront of working from home or uh, what they call agile working. Uh, you, you don't have a desk, you show up in the morning and you pick a desk and you sit there. That, that was also the way it was in the engineering practice, uh, which was my last yeah. employer. But the reason they were doing that is because they were saving an awful lot of money because rather than yeah. having a hundred desks for a hundred employees, and it was more a thousand desks for a thousand employees, they would have 700 or 600 desks for a thousand employees because yeah. the employees are out and about on a construction site or in a client's meeting or something like that. But that means that you, as, as a company, you only pay for the space for 600 desks <laughs> instead of the space of a thousand desks. And uh, in a place like London, that's a lot of money you're saving yeah. every month. Re yeah, it, you know, renting places is expensive in London. So I think it's, it's because I mean, I worked in a technology, um, uh, I worked in an IT company before the charity. So I've worked with uh, sellers like Citrix uh, and VMware doing the virtual, you know, work from home, you know, buy your, buy your own device, work on any device kind of situation. So I've known for years that the capacity and capability is there. But I also mean that the, the, the company I worked for before were the kind of employer that were like, buy this uh, online stuff to help your staff work at home. Ignore the fact that all our staff work in the office because we don't trust them to work from home. So, you know, I've worked in that kind of environment where we'd sell the products, but we wouldn't do it ourselves. Um, so I've known it's been capable for years. So whenever I've heard people sort of say, oh, our boy says we can't work from home because the, the technology is not there. And I'm like, well, actually, I think you'll find it is. It's just rather expensive. But actually now, you know, VPNs, remote desktops, video conferencing calls, you know, the amount of things. So we use we use Teams at the moment. We are using Skype for Business. My uh, director uses or my CEO uses Zoom. Actually, I don't need any fancy software get a video conferencing system, get everyone on a call, have a chat, get them away to go and do some work. It works really well. And the technology is actually there and it's been stable for a while and capable for a while. It's just that people haven't invested in it. And obviously they've had to invest in it now. And the great thing about right now, because they've had to invest in it, they can continue to invest in it because they've already invested in it. Yeah. Um... You know, so... I think it will really change the way people work. And I think actually for someone who has uh, sensory issues and disabilities and is autistic, it's really exciting for me because I struggle with the office environment. I struggle with going to work. I actually had this conversation with my other half the other day and he said to me, he's like, this is something he's worried about for the last handful of years. He always thought that I'd get to a point where I wouldn't actually be able to work anymore because of how much I struggle in an office environment. He kind of was getting to that point where he's like, one day it's going to twig that she can't work anymore. Um, but this whole new world of being able to work from home, actually, that changes things for me. If I don't have to go into an office and deal with sensory overload from people and lights and sound and heat and all of the other things, because why do they put lights on in the office during the day? There's a sun out there, for God's sake. Yeah, it's, I mean, I mean, and and uh, pff, again, the transport as aspect, the the amount of energy and space oh. which is invested in, in in all of that, and I'm not even talking about cars, but even even uh, much more sustainable modes of transport. It's still oh. still a huge endeavor yeah. to to do. But yeah, th there was actually a, a few tweets about that at the beginning, uh, and it was a very good point that a lot of people with the wide range of disabilities had been mm -hmm. told for years and years that they could not do this or that work because they had to show up at an office and go through the train station and 
uh, be able to to access the place with mm -hmm. a wheelchair, which even if it's physically possible because the the, the place is designed for it, is still a major hassle. Uh, yeah. While well, all those people are not well, oh, funny. Now it's, oh, when yes, it starts yes. to be the everybody's problem. No, it turns out that it's possible to work from home. It wasn't two yeah. years ago when uh, that person applied to, it, to the it really came down. It really came down to the finances and the and the cost. You know, if you've got one day a disabled employee who needs all of this support, it's expensive. Why bother? If you've got 100 non-disabled staff who you have to give this to because otherwise your business is going to go under because you're going to have to close, suddenly businesses want to spend that money and that, that's actually the really telling sign is that a lot of these organizations who haven't done this before didn't do it because they couldn't do it they just didn't do it because they didn't want to spend the money and now that I it's would, i would slightly disagree with the the money thing i mean i get it the money but i think that there's also a big question and it's just a very tough thing to change and not just the management but even the employees that there's the culture Behavior. of it because <laughs> money again working uh, from for that engineering practice which is very large multinational uh they had offices in several places in the uk and we had people come from liverpool for meetings and when you look at all of that you're saving that much so much more yeah. money as, I think as a also business the cultural thing's really important you know i've worked for a lot of ceos in the past i mean not my current CEO, who he's brilliant, hence why, you know, he supported working from home the instant, even before we'd shut down, even before lockdown, he was sending everyone home by the droves. But I've worked for those CEOs who are like, if I can't see the staff working, I don't trust that they're working. And so it's that real cultural thing that comes from the CEO down to the heads off, down to the managers, or even down to the staff, because you actually start thinking yourself, well, if I'm not in the office, I'm clearly not working, because that's the culture that you've been told and you've lived in and so it's it's this continuous you know culture is a really really massive aspect and i think the advantage of the situation right now is terrible as it is and it's an awful situation a positivity is is it's helping us shift to cultural behaviors because we've had to yeah even between employers because uh, in an environment where people could work from home i remember a lot of employers saying of another employer not being in that day but working from yeah. home oh they're having it easy they're working from home a lot of people are finding out right now that working from home well it's it's working <laughs> it's, i mean it's... i i've worked from home um i worked from home I, well, I used to work from home one day a week um and again part of that was because of my disabilities and my sensory things it was to try and ne negotiate and find a balance between doing a job i'm brilliant at and i love in an organization that i love and and dealing with the sheer effort of going to london um and because i've had um over the last year i had you know therapy I was going to see a psychologist, so I'd also have work from, I'd work from home the days so I'd go and see my psychologist. Um, I've had a lot of health problems that have been kind of connected to actually, it turns out probably connecting to the the abuse I was putting myself through by traveling into London every day. But I have like a, a colleague and it's, it's all jokes and banter because that's the kind of relationship I have with him. But it kind of is interesting to that because whenever I come in the office, he'll be like, oh, you're in the office today, are you? You just didn't want to have another lazy day at home. And it's always this sort of banter about, oh, well, I thought you'd quit because I hadn't seen you in like three days. Um, and although I know with him, it's, you know, that's just our relationship. We've always bantered. There is a part of me that's always like, well, do other people think this? Do other people think that I'm lazy? I'm not working as hard because I have to have these times at home. And actually, those times at home are what make me capable of doing what I can do and and being in the office because otherwise what happens is I overload I have a meltdown I scream at everyone and tell them to fuck off because I excuse my French but that is literally what I would do I would swear at everybody and just scream and shout and lose my shit it's not very professional but when you're in the middle of a meltdown it's really difficult to determine what is professional and what is just your brain screaming um but it is that kind of you do have that moment when you're like when you do that cultural behavior when you used to work from home before is that you'd worry that other people thought that you were just having an easy day or a bit of a jolly or you know you're just slack you know how many times I've thought to myself maybe I'm just lazy maybe I'm just slack maybe if I just tried a bit harder I'd be able to cope like everyone else so I think now everyone's learning that working from home can be quite difficult and stressful um, especially I don't have to worry about it if you have kids at home yeah, kids at home is uh yeah. I mean, uh, let's, <laughs> I let's, don't have to worry about working from home and having kids. Let, let's let's try to to get back to to the subject of of gaming. Why why 
uh, using what yeah. we've been discussing, which is, which is amazing. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm concerned that people might sign up to this uh, stream or <laughs> uh, <laughs> YouTube to something about gaming. I, have you have you played? This, the, uh, this is this is a gaming YouTube channel. Why are they talking about all sorts of rubbish? It's cathartic. It's the <laughs> yeah. uh, but, uh, also you, it's me and Callum. We talk shit. Have, have you? Uh, because but to be fair, uh, we're talking about all this cultural thing yeah. and. Uh, and it's happening in the gaming world. It's happening with yes. a lot of tabletop RPG fans. Uh, I, th th this weekend was Grog Meet, which is for, based, uh, organized by the Grognard Files podcast. And uh, as the term uh, leads people to think Grognard, it's rather old school roleplay, not, not necessarily OSR, but uh, yeah, the old games, let's say. And and they had their online convention. It was not the first time they were having one, but they had way more of their audience join the online convention. And there were a lot of people who were there. Oh, I'm using Anger. I'm using Roll Twenty. Or oh, does that work? And uh, yeah. it's new. Uh, a lot of people are are uh, putting behind because they don't have a choice. Uh, they're prejudiced towards gaming online, and they're, they're starting doing mm -hmm. so. So, but you've been doing that for a while yourself. So yeah. So I um actually interesting you you asked the question. Um, so I've got a friend. Of course, I always I work ask with. interesting questions. You ask the most interesting questions, Callum. Um, so one of the guys that I work with, he recently a little while ago started getting to D and D, and it was one of those moments when he's like, "Cat, I need to tell you, I've been playing D and D," and he was so excited, and I was like. I, I felt like a proud parent that I, I'd encouraged him enough to. So he met, emailed me today and he was like, so he's like, I've been playing um, a lot of D&D &D, uh, on Roll20. And what's quite interesting is that his game, he lives in London and his game is with his friends back home. So he'd normally only play it in real life when he went back home. But because everything is online now, he's playing, playing a lot online on Roll20. And he's like, is that what you use? It's a pretty good system. And I was like, well, you know, it's kind of complicated because I have many D, D games and rpg games but the stuff that was online that's always been online um again i've always used roll 20 it's you know it works uh i'd never use the video in roll 20 i don't think i have ever used the video system in roll 20 i always use either zoom skype or webby um but you know, he, it's it's really interesting to see. I know I've got quite a few groups of friends now who are like, oh, I've tried Roll20 for the first time. Because again, they're all playing in real life, sitting around a table and they can't right now. And because lockdown's gone on so long, they're like, well, I've, you know, they've got to get their d and Everybody has to get their D&D &D and RPG fix. So it's really great to see all these people embracing tools and going, oh, I've discovered this thing called Roll20. And I'm like, oh, mate, you're like five years behind the times. But seeing having been in the sort of online D&D community and the online RPG community and also having people in my real life who weren't part of that community seeing that kind of start to meld together is quite exciting to see people being like well you know how do you do it how do you do on the line what what are the online tools and how does this work and you know I've got a friend who normally would DM, uh, DM in, in the actual and he's now teaching himself Roll20 to be able to DM uh, online um, we don't, interestingly, use Roll20 for my home game, but that's because we never used Roll20. Um, and my home game, which is technically not a home game anymore, was split between three players around the table and two players online. So I have the camera I've got here, which is a, uh, it's basically just a webcam. I wish I could show you, but it's on like one of those uh, uh, lamp arms that move like this. Okay. So you can move it around. Um, but what we do is we basically, we use maps and minis and that's called the battle cam and you can angle it to oh, down wow. to the map and then you angle it back up. So we've always, because I couldn't use Roll20 when I had so many people in the house with me and the laptop is usually in a place where I can't reach it. That's what we've always done. And so now it's we've gone online with that group. We use something like Zoom for the video chatting uh, and we use battle cam and I mean, also, so because Callum, I have a lot of maps and I have all these minis up here that need to be used. So Roll20 doesn't work for that game. I wouldn't know um, about it because you never invited me to a game. Well, do you know what? Maybe, <laughs> maybe, you know, well, just, all right. I will invite you to a game and you can see all the maps I've got, but, right? But, but I'll make thing, you a map. 
Th that's the thing. Uh, uh, we got D20 Future Show in the chat room. Uh, I believe it's Richard. Uh, hello, Richard, or somebody hey, else from, from your crew. And, and he's asking a question. You sort of started answering it, but I want to, to answer it myself. So he's yeah. asking, would you say you are playing more during lockdown? I know I am. Where are you finding players? What the thing is, so two things. Uh, this weekend, I was playing for the third, maybe fourth time, a board game with my brother in Paris and my mother. Amazing. Uh, and uh, well, last weekend's been tough because my uh, my mother's been sandbagging uh, crazily the game uh, in <laughs> due to uh, part of a misunderstanding. But uh, yeah, I we never we we used to play board games as children with my mother uh, quite a bit and uh, my brother and the last time we had played a board game with her I think would have been Christmas not last year but the year before and now we're playing uh, once or twice a week we're playing Splendor so via Steam and a sharing thing which is not uh, super working but it, it, it's working and it, it's quite yeah. it's quite crazy to have my mother to play online with us that so is actu awesome, actually. So, so actually I'm interacting but more with my mother and my brother than I did yeah. before the lockdown. Yeah. And then tonight, for the second session, uh, I'm going to play a game with my, uh, not all the players, but pretty much my very first role-playing group. The one with who I played for the first time in Belgium, the, the game master, his wife, a friend, and two other people I don't know. Uh, we're playing a game together via Roll20. Uh, it's a it's an old campaign uh, initially written for Delta Green in France, and now it's been re-released with their own system. But yeah, it's crazy because he would ne never have offered me to join one of their game. Or he would it's never have. You know. And he's running all his game on uh, online now. So. Um, and I think for me, I yes or no to be playing more D and D. Um. So the D&D is, because we'd already booked in the sessions for the group before we went into lockdown, it was based around everyone's diary and availability. The players have informed me that their, their availability is much more ready than it was. And we could do D&D &D every week. And I did point out that, you know, some of us have to prep the game. <laughs> and need a bit of space in between no, you know you i'm need, like it's all fine that you can play it every week you need to um, your game to be emergent to share agency and let the the yeah, players come up with the, the game and, uh, and improvise <laughs> i mean to be honest callum i 90 percent improvise because i'm lazy and because i i consider my role as a dm is to take the brilliant ideas they come up with and go oh i'll pretend that was mine i like that one Oh, that's great as well. Brilliant. Um, but in regards to other games, so I mean, I, I so I've got a, uh, an RPG group which we called the Absolute Somethings because, to be honest, we're absolutely something, and I don't mean that in a good way. Mainly, we cause chaos. Um, and we just started before lockdown happened. We just started off Tales from the Loop. So, uh, and normally because of diaries and busyness, we normally play like once every three months. Um, we literally have played several times since lockdown which is kind of cool so although i haven't found more games the games i have i've been able to play more because i don't have a million things in my diary at the moment but you were playing have... you were playing quite a bit already before the lockdown yeah. that's also yeah. the situation um, i guess yeah but you know if anybody can tell me where you can find players i've actually interestingly written oh d20 are not the first people to ask me my friend uh of facebook messaged me the other day and she's like quick question where where did you find your players and i was like well i mean some of them i've just known for so long that they're stuck with me um i was just and and then she was like well how did you find your online and then i tried to work out how to explain my connection to everybody online and how that happened and i was like well i just kept i turned up to events and i i, I basically wrote myself into working with people i just kept being like hi <laughs> i'll do a thing for you um but yeah, she was, you know, sort of saying that, you know, she wanted more D&D games and more RPG games and, you know, where, where to find them. So, like, you know, any advice and tips? If people have a great place that they know to find D&D games, tweet me so I can tell people. Because actually, that's a really important thing right now. We should all be playing more games. But yeah. I also like what you said, Callum, that a lot of what you're doing is actually the people that you'd normally 
you wouldn't get a chance to play these games with because normally, you know, your friend uh, that you haven't played with for years, he'd probably just do it in his house with a few people over. And now because everything's online, well, yeah, you can have Callum who's in the UK because everybody's online. It doesn't make a difference. Well, the good thing is that you can play with almost anybody you know rather than the people who happen to be in your area. Yeah. So, and that's uh, the great thing about online. Yeah, next next yeah. week I'm going to play also with Willem from he's got a, his own podcast called Ice Cream for Everyone. He lived in London for a little while. He was on uh a birthday episode of mine and the episode about Nephilim and he's he's been to the US, to Chicago and now he's back in Paris. And there's someone else called Sandra who's also the, the two of them are co-hosts of another show or run by somebody else called Voix d'Altaride which is in French we, uh, Ice Cream for Everyone is in English so people should go check it out but uh, yeah I've been listening to them for a while uh, we exchanged a few tweets and because we had a online convention in France uh, at some point I said hey uh, we, we were in the chat room while another panel was running and I told Sandra well I would like to play with you one day show, yeah, yeah yeah let's do it so we're gonna play with Willem and Sandra so it's it's an opportunity for you to play with whoever you interact with on Twitter on TikTok or, or Facebook and actually going back to because we talked briefly about that sort of online friends and and converting real relationships into online so normally like a couple of my best friends who I play D&D &D with who you know often I've played D&D &D online with and I play in real life they live just around the corner now on a Friday night or a Saturday night, they'd probably come over here and we'd all veg out on the sofa and just watch crap and eat food and junk food and just hang out. Obviously, we can't do that at the moment because we're all abiding by social distancing and we're all staying at home. Um, so we're doing online calls. But what's really great about that is that because we're online anyway, doing a you know, Zoom call in essence or, or whatever, some video chat call, we were like, well, why don't we invite our friend from Germany and our friend from New Zealand? because they happened to be we knew that they were about so we sent them a message and we were like hey come and join us but obviously if Ryan and Cole came over for the evening normally we'd just hang out the four of us but suddenly we were like well if we're on a video call and this video conferencing call can take 12 people we'll invite the D&D &D group and we'll invite that D&D &D group and we'll just invite everyone to come and hang out with us so then we're like on a video call with our friend from Germany and our friend from New Zealand and I had this moment I was like the only time I've hung out with these humans it, all in one place is either when we've played D&D &D online or the one time Cake and Hanno came over to visit me in the UK. And I was like, why haven't we done this before? Like, because you never think about it. When, when people are coming to your house, you don't think, oh, well, you come over. I'll just video conference in someone else. But suddenly yeah, we're all just hanging out. It, so I'm having, I'm actually hanging out more with people that I wouldn't normally get the chance to because... I'm video calling people. It's funny because, you know, before, and again, that's a question of will this remain? Uh, maybe especially with younger people. But, uh, but by the way, uh, D20, Richard from D20 Future Shot uh, uh, encourages people to tweet at them if they're looking for, for games to play. Uh, but uh, yeah, how many evenings are you'd like to go out or do something, hang out. I, I miss those evenings spending at each other's, you know, when you have a child, uh, yeah. spending at each other's home, maybe watching something, listening to music, um, having a drink, uh, you know, just hanging out, the, the sort of things I was doing as a student. But I would, I, to be honest, I'm not at that point yet, but uh, yeah, being at, at this stage of saying, Hey, why don't we just throw a watch along uh, of a movie or just a, a video call and we hang out in our living room and we, we just chat with, with one another because because why not? We've got the technology to do so. And actually, one of the things that's really interesting about the technology and that it's encouraged. So obviously being online, people who, you know, played in the online community, you, I know you've been on um Twitch streams for, for RPGs and so have I um, you know we're already used to that technology of being able to be like well you know I you know I, I for years I've played with someone from New Zealand and someone from Germany and that person's from Canada and that person's so we knew that technology and that capacity is there but it's really interesting to see how it's been embraced and things like you know Netflix having their 
watch party so i could watch something and someone in a completely different country if as long as they've got the same netflix and we can just hang out and chat and watch I'd like the same to do thing that, and... a watch party have you done one already or, or does that work I, i've I mean... not done one but i've heard really good things about them and and you know i've got a couple of friends who do it quite regularly and they'll just you know hang out and they'll just you know chat while they're watching and it's i really love the fact the functionality that you can just watch the film or you can have the chat open but you don't have to have both uh -huh. so you kind of get your own experience and one of the greatest things that i've seen recently so using twitch and again we're on twitch right now we've both done a lot of twitch stuff we know the capacity of the live streaming so our local nightclub so where i live we have a local rock club uh a metal club it's basically uh, i mean to be honest it's just us lot and we always used to go and we just listen to the same things you know from the 80s and 90s because we're old and dated um obviously can't have the rock club at the moment because we're all staying at home so they've started streaming on twitch so they basically just one of their djs just keeps playing like a fun mix of things but actually what this has meant is that most of my friends on a friday night just go into the ch uh, twitch chat and they just hang out and just throw banter and suddenly a whole bunch of people who i've never really thought of as being online people You know, they were my non-online friends. I had online friends and non-online friends. And suddenly they're all online chatting away, getting in Twitch chat chats. And I'm like, oh. So it's really interesting to see how so many people have just adapted it into their lifestyle. Yeah. And I think the one point which I could imagine someone uh, criticizing aspects of that. But I think the, the point that people sometimes don't realize is that it's not replacing going to <laughs> the rock club. But actually doing it could mean that instead of doing I don't, going, I don't know, once per month or once every yeah. two months, you sort of go in, you online there every week or so every two weeks. Yeah. And then every two months, it's sort of the bigger event for the, the people you engage with so much weekly yeah. to meet physically. It's, a, it's like the critters, it's the example I always take. Uh, all the critters I met at MCM London Comic Con who, who, who clicked so well once they met in person at Comic Con. It was the first time yeah. in, I don't know, three, four, five years they met physically. And when they did, that was a big cherry on top of this rela online relationship yeah. they had developed. And actually, it's going to be really interesting to see, you know, so something again, going back to being in part of the crit, uh, crit role community and the, the online RPG community, we both know what those forming our friendships. I mean, our friendship formed online when we messaged each other a few times and you were like, hey, you're a podcast. Well, I'm doing this podcast thing. Do you want to come? And you invited me a couple of times to your um, the, the London events you had. We don't see um, each other physically uh, so no. often. Uh, I think like about over... once a year or twice a year, I think we see yeah. each other in person. When, when Satine um, shows up, and I'm not even that available <laughs> to discuss with you, which is a pity. You, you just basically there. we see each other when Dragon Meat happens and when Satine comes over to the UK. Yeah. They are the two times we see each other in person. And usually, I, I'm talk... very stressed. <laughs> I come to you, I look at you, I'm like, I'm freaking out. Is, is, is everything going yeah. alright? You're like, yeah, you're fine. Yeah. Don't worry. Basically, that's that's my job, isn't it, Callum? Just to stand there and be like, breathe. You're okay. You're doing a great job. But we'd already formed a friendship on um, online, and that friendship was because we speak to each other quite regularly. You know, when we were running the, um, doing the management for the podcast, and we spoke almost daily. And actually, you, those conversations, you know, I, one of my best friends, um, Hanno, um, again, I just started talking to him online. I think actually how I met him was I convinced him to buy some expensive dice. Um, Hanno that was his being a guest hate. on the Rollies podcast when he visited London. So yep. go check it out. Um, And he's a really lovely guy. Uh, he was a great guest for Callum. Uh, speaks very highly of the podcast. Um, but yeah, when I met him for the first time, you know, I'd spoken to this person every single day nearly. So that friendship's really, really strong. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see how people who are not used to that online community. So a lot of my friends have always been a bit like, oh, you met this person online, did you? It's a bit weird. You know, the first time I, you know, Hannah turned up to my work and everyone's like, who's this strange man? And I was like, he's a strange man I met off the internet. And they were like, okay that's a bit unsettling someone um, someone actually... came up to me at my wedding uh in belgium uh and told me uh yeah it, she was the guest of of one of my guests she was a plus one mm -hmm. and at some point she confided to me saying, yeah so actually i met uh, I, i met your friend uh, online uh, 
And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I, like I, I met my new wife online. You know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be stressed <laughs> yeah. about that. I met Persephilia through couch surfing. And yeah. then we met and for a poker game. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, there was a point uh, some time ago when people sort of frowned upon online relationships and communications. And you often see the, the tweets going around, retweet this if, you know, your, your online friends are as good as your real life friends and that kind of thing. And actually, I think this is going to encourage people to understand that it doesn't matter, you know, so whether it's friendship, gaming or what have you, actually, like my games, when I sit at the table with my players, are equally as connected and strong as those ones I play online, that actually that makes no difference. The technology makes no difference to my gaming. You know, I love my online gaming group as much as I love my in real life gaming group. I love, you know, those people I've met online and I've had connections with and I've, you know, done stuff like this and, you know, and there's so many friends I have that I really, really value that come from this online community um, that have, you know, but also, you know, I, you know, I'm very good friends with Mira now. You introduced me to Mira because Mira is a friend of yours. So again, that was a, an online, and, by online, by online association. And we are friends because she followed me on Instagram and then she showed up <laughs> uh, at Dragon Meet. Uh, and that's recorded <laughs> on the show. So, so uh, Mira is an <laughs> online friend. It's someone I see much <laughs> more online than I, I, I do. We should have a watch along. I think I'm going to look into orga to organize that and do oh, something. We should do that. Yeah. But I think, you know, it, it will be really interesting to see how this changes the space of gaming. Because I think a lot of people have that sort of, you're either an online game or, or you're in actuality and actually technology allows us to do everything you know we get to play games with people we wouldn't have to play before it doesn't matter whether we're all sat in our own houses or we're sat together you know there is the, the technology is going to give us the capacity I, i'm still by the way i still love the fact that because of the technology and because of the lockdown situation you've been gaming with your mum i love that mum if you're watching this i'm not gaming with you She's not. <laughs> she's not watching this. No, she's not. <laughs> Nobody in Belgium is watching this. I've gamed with my parents. I did a board game a little while ago with my parents, and they drove me insane. I don't know. I cope with teaching. The, oh, the, the last either. session, it was. Oh, if people are uh, familiar with Splendor, so she just, you, you can keep aside cards. You know, you you buy cards in this. You 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 got yeah. gems on the side, and with the gems you buy the cards. And when you got the cards, they work as gems, which you cannot lose, and so on. And you got. Sort three levels of diff how expensive the gems are, and she, she just picked. No, nobody's gonna get that, explaining it, but she picked the the highest costing a couple of highest costing cards, and was hell bent on purchasing them with gems. But it's it's almost mathematically mathematically impossible to do so because you need cards of those <laughs> gems to to be enough because it's limited the number of gems you had. But as a result of that. She was holding two colors of the gems for 10 turns. And me and my brother, we were in a situation where we could not just do anything. I mean, we could just do one thing uh, mindlessly. But <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, but coming back on technology, one aspect I find interesting, and, and uh, it's going to take a bit of time, but p people always think, oh, you got an invention, you got a technology, then people do something with it. And wow, that's, that's crazy. Oh. We, we invented the, the print press, uh, Gutenberg, and then we had books. Uh, we invented smartphone, and then we got Facebook. And it's not quite like that. Uh, I find it's more, there's a need, then somebody says something which already exists, yeah. improves it. And I already know of people right now working on better tools to work online, uh, you know, yeah. better integrated. And it's gonna be interesting to see how the tools, the interface, gonna improve as a result of a demand or, or I don't know I could imagine you were mentioning Netflix that it could become a thing that Netflix itself integrates on your television a watch along feature rather yeah. than you having to use Twitch or another yeah, software at the moment so. they've developed it and you have to download the software but you know that's the other thing like we both know is people who've been gaming online for years and streaming and doing podcasts and things like this that the technology has been there but it's it's sort of a bit hit and miss sometimes you know because not everybody was using it so not all the money has been invested in it but now everybody is kind of moving to an online world you know people are like you said already looking at how do we 
how do we improve that software? How do we invest that? So how would we take what we've always used and actually not just use it, whether it's all right or not, and actually make it fit for purpose? So I actually think this is going to have a really interesting insurgence of, of people going, well, there has always been this need, but we now there's enough people identifying the need that we have a reason to to go ahead and do these things. So a I critical actually think mass that this, of demand so yeah. that you can develop the thing. And I actually think more and more people are going to, you know, video conferencing software, online gaming software, all of these are going to become more and more uh, integrated into our daily lives because suddenly for the first time, like it's always felt like there's been the online world and then the non-online world and they do not cross. And now you've got kind of this mix. So now we've kind of people who've never gone online are going online and doing the online gaming and the online streaming and all of that kind of thing. Yeah, actually... We're going to have more people doing it and more technology. It's going to be really interesting. Yeah, I, I hope they're going to invest also heavily in the uh, the raw infrastructure. Like my, my bandwidth in my neighborhood, what's available, it's uh, it's a bit limited. <laughs> yeah. so it would be nice to have some fiber and this. And I think people, not only for some rando like me who's doing a streaming about podcasts and mainly talking about uh, random stuff, but uh, for... For, for people working from home, for hospitals, for, yeah. for key workers who can do it from working from home. All of that, you, you're going to need this bandwidth, so it's going to be interesting. Uh, it reminded me also, uh, you like, uh, since you like my mom, uh, <laughs> we, uh, my son's birthday happened in lockdown. So uh, we did uh, the cake and the candle, so it was just me, uh, Persephilia and my son. But we 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 had it in visual conference with uh, his, his two grandmother and his grandfather, and with multiple cameras, the cameras from the laptop and the cameras from my phone, oh, so they had bless. different angles. So yeah, it's but that's something. Well, interestingly, so our wedding is supposed to be in October this year. So don't know yet what whether that's going to happen but one of my guests even if the wedding happens one of my guests is from New Zealand now I know for a fact that New Zealand have said that they're not going to open their borders until there's a cure or until there's a vaccine so that might mean in October I might be able to get married but one of my best friends might not be able to come from New Zealand because if they haven't opened the borders she can't fly out and now if I'd ever mentioned streaming our wedding to my fiance he would have been like we're not getting married get out of the house that is it I'm calling off the wedding and I said to him if Cake can't make it from New Zealand, could we stream it for her? And he was like, yeah, all right. And straight away, because of the situation, but it was really interesting, Had the, there was no way he would have ever agreed to that before. But he was like, well, actually, yeah, you really want her there and she's one of your best friends. And if that's the way for her to see your wedding, then we'll stream it for her. Well, the, so it's a... really interesting, those shifts. That's also interesting to see, you know, looking even a, a bit forward, I remember going to the London Science Fiction Convention, LONCON, and someone attended the convention uh, via telepresence of, with mm. a, well, I guess a, there's no way to describe it, a, a robot. So something on two wheels, like picture a robot without arms on something like a Segway with a screen instead of a face. And on the screen, you have the person who was, I believe that person might have been in, in New Zealand, actually. That person was attending that convention via this thing on wheel. And there was a thing, oh, it's a science fiction convention. So people were open-minded and excited about it. But that's something you would find, first, odd at a wedding. Yeah. And second, is probably expensive. But yeah. but if if it's getting more common... It's getting less expensive because then you've got a business doing that. They've got a number of them and they've got enough customers so they can rent them out on a regular basis. Uh, I'm not picturing wedding with only these telepresence thing, <laughs> but uh, in terms of, but well, you, know, you, can, you cannot fly if your friends, you know, that would be a nice tool if your friend, uh, I don't think it would, it would be affordable, although I have no idea, so it, it might be interesting to investigate. Uh, that that would be a cool way to, to go to an event, uh, to be <laughs> like that. Uh, and I think actually, you know, this is that massive uh, jump in, in you know, technology tends to do this. It has those moments where there is a catalyst, something happens. So like you said about, you know, um, flying and after 9-11, there's usually a catalyst that makes us change and look at the way we do things. And I think this is one of those moments where that real shift to thinking about online and how online can 
be beneficial um, would never have happened before. But this has forced people to look in things in different ways. And, and actually, there's probably going to be a huge technology jump in the next few years for those kind of how do you how do you get someone who's all the way over there to this event here without actually having to physically move them to the event? And I think we're going to have a massive jump in that kind of technology because this situation has demanded it. Yeah, and it's it's. I am really interested about having a robot at my wedding now. I will be honest. I'm going to tell my fiance tonight. That's a thing. You know, that's that's if... that's slightly less positive. But you know, when we're working <laughs> about key workers like deliveries and so on, mm. uh, you know, not so long ago there were a lot of there, there are a lot of businesses working on technological solution for making deliveries uh, automated or not using uh, w an actual uh, workforce in person. Well, those businesses now, <laughs> their value in stock markets and the interest in their products has hit the roof, so went through the roof. So now having a, a drone or something on wheels roll its way through the, the sidewalks of London to deliver your pizza. It's it's something, uh, yeah, which might be more, more useful. Uh, sorry, you were saying about your wedding? To see. Um, I don't know. Well, I think I think it basically, I'm going to stream my wedding, possibly, but only for one person, unless I can push it further. <laughs> well, once... um, and it, it is one of those things, you know, having to make those decisions for how the rest of this year shapes up you know we we know lockdown is going to be for another couple of weeks but we don't know what the shape of things is after lockdown so you know people keep saying to me oh you know you'll be right by, by october we'll all be out and about again and i'm like where do you think the virus is going yeah you, that what do you think is going to happen like when we're all out the virus is going to be there still um so i think actually you know thinking about those things and, and just planning about that future and like well what does the shape of of, of the world mean after this and how do we move forwards what is our normal yeah and uh, it's a virus so first of all this virus having it gone completely is going to be uh, quite a challenge and uh, not an easy uh, a fast one but once we've been through this experience we are much more aware that this is a thing which can happen and it happened with one virus it could happen with another virus yeah. so it's you, interesting how a world that was as as you know confident in their technology and their capitalism infrastructures and their medical infrastructures this virus is actually not even as deadly as some of its related coronavirus viruses so it's not as deadly as SARS but its infection rate is so much higher than SARS that it, that's where the problem comes from our entire infrastructure and capitalism has been brought down by one virus well, it's not, you know, that's, to be fair, it's not brought down, but... Uh... No, but it's it, at the moment, you know, and people are going, well, how do we go back to what our structure was before and what does that structure look like? And, you know, certain certain economic powerhouses and certain things will not come out of this with the financial security that they thought they were going to have. So this has changed so much of the world. And, and it just goes to show that all this confidence in, tech, in, in our technology and our medicine and our infrastructures, we can still... You know, we actually, things can still change the world just because we think that A is going to happen, B can, can easily happen. Yeah, that, that's, you know, there, there was a, I don't know what's the, the right word uh, for it, but there was a line of thinking uh, slash philosophy in the mid to late 90s. Uh, there, there were a group of philosophers and they were kind of popular in mainstream media who were arguing that because... Uh, the wall of Berlin fell, the, the Warsaw Pact fell, it was the final victory of uh, some political views and they were literally saying that it was the end of history because nothing meaningful would never happen again because we the, are living history right now yeah, like it was the world it, order the western world order and I would be ruling and now uh, there would be minor wars here and there but the, there will never be major global events that we would have to face and would change history well yeah that it's happening now We're here i mean this is a moment actually each of us have to take that step back and actually really appreciate that we're living history in 20 30 40 50 years time when they teach history at school this is going to be a moment that's going to be covered. You know, you think about how many times people have compared this to the Spanish flu, uh, 1918 pandemic of Spanish flu. Now, 
this isn't the first time we've you know i we, we learned about things like the 19 20, uh, 1918 spanish flu pandemic at school and all of these things that was a moment in history and we're living another one right now yeah. that's going to like you said change technology you know there'll be conversations in 10 years time and 20 years old oh, this piece of technology came out of that pandemic situation this yeah. new culture, this work culture, or what have you, came out of that pandemic situation. And when the, they will teach it, they will say, that's when streaming started. <laughs> we were there. Yeah. No, yeah. It... <laughs> Literally, we're like, no, we were streaming way before that. <laughs> Streamers were streaming before that. It's just everyone else got on streaming then. We, we were cool because <laughs> it was cool. But we were doing this way before. God, no, does that make, now everybody's doing, does it make what we've always been doing for years cool and down with the kids? No, it's making it common, and now it's going to be grabbed by uh, much more popular people. <laughs> it's like you look at TikTok, and now you need to compete with uh, Kevin Hart and uh, Will Smith and The Rock. And the, oh, the, yeah, because the, they're the things. The... Is, and it's like, no, um, Jack Black is doing because they're all obviously at home. They've all in isolation as well, so they're all TikToking now. So all of us average people who thought this was our moment to be famous, no, just... now all the famous people can't go out and act. <laughs> They are doing TikTok and streaming it, yeah, so it's a, blowing move, us out of the water. Move aside. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Stephen Colbert. Yeah, okay. I guess your yeah, yeah. your live stream is, is with yeah. Kid Blanchett. Although I have That's... enjoyed watching a lot of bands do their... So I watched the Kaiser Chiefs rewrite of their song, which is so their stay-at-home version. Uh, that was really fun. i loving uh, pandemic-related uh, rewrites of songs. So there's a guy called Chris Mann. Um, and he's done so many covers and they are brilliant and he does the best videos you can clearly tell he's obviously really bored at home uh desperate to go out and make music so he's just doing these amazing funny videos at home but yeah putting the rest of us normal everyday people who don't have that kind of technology to shame well there's a funny thing though the most of them has got a level of technology maybe they got more equipment because they can throw the money their money at amazon but uh but actually they're using the same stuff we are yeah yeah they have and they they knew at this so sometimes the, the quality of what they do is not uh, they, they don't master the tools uh, as we do and they cannot have an engineer show up and do everything for them they, i mean to some extent they no, can yeah, remotely... that is true they are going to have to learn to do the sound engineering themselves which is what we've all been doing for years well i say we i tend to turn up to other people's twitch streams and podcasts and let them do all the technical stuff do you <laughs> 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 You're not doing editing, podcast editing? Uh... Nope, I haven't done podcast editing for a while, but I have done video editing and I obviously will be doing video recording and editing. I have debated at some point putting all of the YouTube videos into uh, audio only and releasing them as podcasts. It's just, it's just, the, like, it's still actually just the time because I'm actually really enjoying um, doing a lot of reading at the moment. So for me, that's kind of, I've got a pile of books like this, like, a huge pile of books that are my uh lockdown reads um but no <laughs> i will do some podcast editing at some point but at the moment i'm focusing on the video stuff yeah which i have well, taught myself I'm so asking, you know i'm asking and i'm throwing the question to richard in the the chat room because i'm longing to record a uh, rpg academy film study so for that i need volunteer uh oh you know it's quotation mark established uh, RPG podcaster who and when you volunteer you host you pick the movie but you edit the show as well so I'm probably gonna yeah, do so what... I can I can do the hosting and I can do the pick the show but I'm not quite sure I'm ready to edit it and I wouldn't yeah. want to I wouldn't want I... to do something for the RPG Academy and pick it up and I, I can I just can't do uh, one. Oh, dear, side question: Are you s some? Uh, we, we're gonna have to cut this uh, after mm -hmm. because my I need to wake up my son from his nap. You need to deal with the boy. Uh, but uh, are you a fan of Smallville, per chance? Smallville, actually, interestingly, me and my other half went through an obsessive couple of months where we watched almost all of Smallville. So I'd watched it growing up, um, but he hadn't. Uh, so actually, um, I've watched many series of it, and okay. I'm a very big fan. I'm gonna of it. put you in touch with. I don't know if I did already, but I'm gonna put you in touch with Michael from the RPG Academy because he's got a a side project which uh, he recorded. Uh, I mean, uh, people can connect the dots and, and picture what it's about, but uh, uh, he's, he's about to record his twelfth episode. I recorded one with him also. I'm gonna episode, record episode fourteen with him. 
and uh, he's looking for guests and uh, I think it would be would be nice to have someone uh, outside of the RPG Academy uh, to to oh, join his guest. So anything else to 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 plug? Uh, where can people find you and so on? I'm very sorry, so but I really need to wake up my son. So you can find me on you can find me on Twitter at as at cat tulip. Um, you can find our YouTube stuff uh, under Geeks Dog and D and D, uh, and the particular stuff we are doing is Did and D and D. Um, I will tweet some stuff out later if I remember. Um, the main place to find me is Twitter. So come find me on Twitter. I tend to share anything that I'm doing, both my Did and D and D stuff and any other random things like Callum's show on my Twitter. So if you ever want to find out what else I'm doing, that's the best place. And tomorrow, if you're all around, um, 8.30, our time, my time, 8.30 my time. I don't know what that means for anyone else, uh, but 8.30 B my time. BST right now, British summer time. That one, 8.30 BST. Uh, we will be going uh, back to the 80s in New Zealand style for our second episode of Tales from the Loop. Uh, so come to my Twitter, check out when I send out the links. Uh, that'll be tomorrow. Uh, Tales from the Loop, 80s style, set in uh, New Zealand. Check that on out. Waikiki I'm sure it's... Island, I think. It's not as uh, you don't have the budget of the new Prime Video till from no, the show, we don't, but uh, I'm sure it's more exciting because apparently it's a bit slow the TV show. Yeah, it's good. It has the feel of of, of Tales from the Loop, but this is exciting because um, I'm in it, uh, obviously, <laughs> uh, and Julie uh, is in it. A couple of other people, but it's just you know, it's you get to learn a lot about 80s New Zealand. Uh, we have some terrible hair going on, some even worse costumes. Um, oh, said, oh, and uh, occasionally I, I didn't catch for when you first said it that it was New Zealand and not Sweden oh wow yeah, yeah New Zealand it's set because um, the, the, the games master is from New Zealand originally so it's set on I think it's Waikiki Island he's probably going to tell me if I've probably pronounced that wrong but occasionally there is an attempt from some of us who are not New Zealand there's two people in the game who are from New Zealand the rest of us attempt very bad New Zealand accents or like me don't bother at all okay <laughs> Okay, I really need to cut it. because I think I, I can hear my son yeah. in, in his bed. Uh, thank you, you so much. With the boy. I'm waiting for your invitation for Good a game, pleasure. for a uh, watch along or, or whatever. Right. Always a pleasure having you. I'm sure okay. I, I'll have you again uh, before it's over. Pleasure to see you. Uh, cheers. Bye. And thanks everyone in the Bye. chat room. Richard, A1 thank Bear, you, chats. another TV much reviewer, Zrizbot. Uh, next time, don't hesitate to throw more questions to us. Yeah, cheers. always questions. Cheers. Troll Callum. Bye.